Welcome to the Get Good at Presenting podcast with Lee Jackson. Hi, and welcome to Get Good at Presenting with myself, Lee Jackson, a speaker and presentation coach. Now, a few years ago, I did some research into slides, PowerPoint, and uh, Keynote, uh, Prezi, and everything else. When we mean slides, I actually mean anything. When I, when I talk about PowerPoint, I didn't really mean any software. I did some research, and I did, I did a short book called PowerPoint Surgery. And I don't really talk about slides too much now, but I've got on the show today a guest, a good friend of mine, Dave uh, Henson, who is going, who is known as the Slide Presentation Man. So uh, welcome, Dave. Thank you, Lee. Pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure. So I thought we'd need to talk about slides that we've done. I've done a few of these podcasts now, and yeah. I sometimes mention them in passing, but actually a lot of people listening will use PowerPoint both well and maybe badly too because we've mm -hmm. all seen that yep. or maybe they've never been trained in it maybe yep. they've never had any expertise so i thought it'd be good just to have a little bit of a chat about how we can use slides better you myself you're, you're a professional speaker like myself uh, but you also you the other service you provide is kind of designing slides for other people isn't it dave yeah it is yeah i mean i um i design slides for clients big and small uh, more often than not, what they'll do is they'll come to me with an existing presentation, which they know can be improved. And um, and then we'll talk through the presentation and uh, and work out how we can improve it and uh, and do just that. Yeah. So without without giving away any names, obviously, you must have uh, you must have seen some shockers come across your inbox. Have you over the years? Yeah, definitely seen some shockers. Um, I mean, I go way back to, to the days of 35 mil slides. And the worst one I ever saw was actually pre PowerPoint when someone gave us um, a disc to image some slides, and they'd done it with yellow text on a white background. Um, nice. Which, yeah, which you couldn't read. But, yeah, there's, there's varying degrees of, um, of quality, shall we say, when uh, people give <laughs> me their slide presentations. So, so yellow text on a white background, that, that's mm. more like an eye test than a PowerPoint yeah. slide, right? Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, it's funny you talk about 35 mil, because I talk about this when I'm doing presentation skills. I, I do a little bit. I always do, like, 15 minutes on slides. Because yes. like you've got to talk about them. It's the elephant in the room, I call it. Mm. Because otherwise, people just go away and and just use their old slides. So I always do a little bit of on it, just to just to sort of say, look, there's a different way of doing them. Yeah. Now, um, when I do that, I talk about the fact that it is too easy to do slides now, because it's not too difficult. It's actually too easy because yeah, I think I've heard Nancy Duarte talk about this and. That in effect, when you had 35 mil slides, when you had OHPs and things like that, it would actually take some thought because you'd have to have them developed oh, and yeah. stuff like that. But now, do, do you agree that people maybe just open up PowerPoint and crack on? You know, that's exactly what they do. They that's the that, that's the thing I try and teach them not to do is that if if someone says you've got to do a presentation, the first thing people do is open up their laptop, open up PowerPoint. And start typing away in PowerPoint, and and you're right, it is so easy. The, you know, I won't, I haven't got time to go through the way we used to do it in the old days, but um, it took significantly longer time to produce a slide than it does now. You can knock out a PowerPoint slide in seconds. So, yeah, um, and that is that is the problem. People don't stop and think about it before they actually get onto uh, get onto the software. So, the people listening to this, they're either professional speakers or public speakers or speaking at work. Uh, you know, they're all from all different sorts of backgrounds. So many of them will use slides already. They're probably thinking about using them. So w what advice do you give in that kind of the basic advice of, look, if you have to use slides, here's three or four tips that will really help. Um, what advice do you give, Dave? The, the advice I give is I use an acronym, which is RICE, R-I-C-E, which stands for Reinforce, Illustrate, Clarify, Explain. So if you've got a point in your presentation that needs to be reinforced illustrated clarified or explained by the use of a visual or a graphic then it's a good candidate for using slides and i think one of the problems is that people and you you'll know this lee some people say oh i never use slides which is which is fine because there's a lot of good storytellers we both know who can give a presentation without using slides but then there are people that say they do use slides and what they mean by that is that they use slides all the time but there is a halfway house where kind of, you know, you, you can be oh, okay. putting a slide up on the screen when you need to. And if you don't need a slide for a particular point, then just let the screen go black so that the audience is focusing back on you again. So so really, I think the, this this acronym, Reinforce, Illustrate, Clarify, Explain, RICE, that works well for for me even, as well as, um, you know, as well as customers. You can say to them, if you've got a point in your presentation that needs one of these four things, 
then it's a good candidate right, for maybe producing a slide. That's a great idea. So, so what you're saying is the day. De- so, death by PowerPoint is, you know, is using a slide for everything. Yes. So, I was at, I was at a recent conference and there was six or seven speakers on that day. Uh, mm. I was actually delegate in the audience, and it, they all had death by PowerPoint. Every single one of them came up. They all looked the same. They all sounded the same. Mm. And that's because they hadn't looked at the rice thing. So the reinforce, illustrate, clarify, explain. Yeah. So actually what you're saying is some sometimes you can speak without a slide. Yep. And then bring one up when you need to. So that yeah. so explain why why do you think people don't do that, Dave? Why do you think they don't do that? I don't know. I just think that they they, they it hasn't ever occurred to them that they can actually not not use if, if they think well well, some people do it because I think they use slides as their aid memoir, their prompt. So yeah which is obviously the wrong thing to do. But most people, I just don't think, have ever thought about the fact that if they're using PowerPoint, they can go they can go black, go blank, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, they just don't think about it. And it, when I talk about it in my workshops, it kind of switches a light on in people's heads, and they think, oh, yeah, I've never thought that, about that before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, do, I do a little thing myself in my workshops where I just show them the B button. Yeah. Um, so you, any, so any slide software, you press B, it goes to black, and yeah. you press W, it goes to white. Yeah. It, it sometimes get a, gets a gasp. It's like people yeah. are, people have used PowerPoint or any slide software for years and years and years, and they go, oh, I never realized that. Yeah. Yeah. That, yes, that. you can walk to your keyboard, your laptop, and you can just press B. I have it on my clicker, but yeah, I do, you yeah. just press B or W, and it literally will go. I mean, black is always the favorite to white, I think. Because white, yeah. white, yeah. white just becomes like a big headlight, doesn't it? So yeah. You, but, but what I do is is um, because the, the problem with doing that is that when you uh, show the screen again, it goes back to the slide that you were originally on, which yeah. you don't normally want. So all, what I do is I prefer to insert a black slide in the presentation rather than actually yeah. using the clicker. But mm-hmm. yeah, it, it is. I think that's it, it, it's a good thing to do. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, it is it, actually it's amazing. Not just with that, but the number of things that you say to people. Did you know you can do this in PowerPoint? Oh, I didn't know you could do that. And it's just you, it's like you're doing magic yeah. on stage with them. <laughs> <laughs> so the so the blank but the blank button would work or inserting a yeah. black slide in between. So you, you move your slides on mm. and it goes to a black slide. Because what, what I found with that is the audience then looks at you. Yeah, precisely. They're not looking at the slide, they're looking at you. Precisely, yeah. Yeah, because whatever whether you've got a projector or whether you've got um, a plasma screen or an L C D screen, that's often happens these days. What people forget is that whether it's a projector or a screen, it's flickering. Yeah. So it's flickering at 100 hertz or whatever, so yeah. like 100 times a second. And so our brain is attracted to the flickering. Yeah. yeah. So this is what happens. So people, because, because it's, the flickering is so fast, we never see it. But our brain is taking in that flickering. And so it's automatically drawing our attention yeah. to the screen instead of – even if the screen's doing nothing – yeah, even if it just has your logo on it, we're yeah. still we're looking at it. Our brain's going, something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. You're absolutely then, right. Yeah, and then when we go blank, <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden the eyes are on you as a presenter, and you can tell the story, or do whatever you need to do. And, and if you introduce any kind of movement on a slide, of course people are going to look at the uh, look at the screen. It's a bit like recently I was in a pub with some people, and they had a small television screen, and they were showing the um some golf on the TV. And I don't even like yeah. watching golf on TV, but because there's movement in the corner of the pub, you keep looking up at it, don't you? It's just there and you look at it whether you want to or not. So it's the same kind of situation. It's a bit like a baby in a cot with a mobile. They love watching all these colours go around. So if you take away that kind of sensory stuff, then people will concentrate on on you. Go Let the screen go black and they can focus back on you again. Yeah, because exactly. As, as I've said a thousand times, we are the presentation, not the slides. So yes, that's exactly absolutely. what you want them to do. Yes, yeah. quite. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so that's one great tip. So we go to black, and we got the rice thing. So is there a couple of a couple of other things that you that you have to say on a daily basis to clients that, you, that you're chatting with and working with? A couple of little mistakes that, that people might find useful in the podcast. Oh, okay. So w- one of the slides I use in my um, in my workshops is um, a slide that I show. They have a, we have a little competition where they have to d- work out the seventeen things that are wrong with uh, with the slide. So what would I say? The seventeen. Most? Yeah, seventeen. Yeah, there's wow. seventeen things wrong on one slide. It's quite good. Nice. <laughs> and in fact, they find even more than that. They find two or three other things that I'd never even thought of. But I suppose okay. Well, so the, obviously, the biggest error that, that we we always see, of course, is 
he's putting too much text on the slide. My one of my mantras is aim towards zero bullet points. And, you know, it doesn't mean you've got to have zero bullet points, but if you aim towards zero bullet points and make sure that then make sure that the slides are congruent with you, you don't want to read off of the slide because people are going to read ahead of you anyway. And it's cognitively exhausting for the audience to try and read the screen and listen to you at the same time. So the slides need to be congruent with what you're saying and complement what you're saying. That's one of the biggest issues that we um, that we see. Yeah. And probably the second thing that I see a lot of is, the, is people cluttering their slides up with stuff that isn't relevant. Things like putting the um, – because PowerPoint lets you do this as part of the template. You can put the date on the slide, and I don't know why anyone would need to put the date on every single slide. Most people know what the date is, and if they don't, <laughs> um, your presentation is probably not their, their main source of, uh, of, of information for <laughs> what, what date it is. So just try to stick with the slide. Just put on the, on the slide the information you need to get the point across that you're trying to make and just take everything else off. That would be the, the, the yeah. biggest point, a declutter and cut down the text. Absolutely. I think one of the reasons that I, I've spoken about over the years, it, one of the reasons that people put their logo and their email address and the date and whatever their extension number, if it's an internal presentation, <laughs> on the slide is because they're expecting the slides to become handouts. Ah, well, that's actually my, my, my biggest point that I make in, in my talks and my workshops is that if your slides work as handouts, they don't work as slides. Um, you know, your slides are ephemeral, so they just need to work for the 10, 20, 30 minutes that you're on stage for your audience and not for you. And then the handouts, uh, if you want to make handouts, then produce them separately. Kind of what makes my heart sink is when you hear a presenter saying, don't worry, I've made all of these slides available as a handout because it means <laughs> they designed them as a handout and not as a slide presentation. Exactly. So we we basically say the same stuff, and we have we to. Do, yeah. <laughs> everything you're saying is exactly what I say. <laughs> and uh, I think it was Gar Reynolds in his book Presentation Zen. Mm. He t he talks about a slide he meant. So it's not a it's not a very good slide, and it's not a very good document. So it's yeah. half and half. So it becomes this kind of slide you meant thing. Slide you meant. Yeah, it's a good word. Yeah, uh, which I think is a great word. And yeah, yeah. So it's, sadly, is he design a slide to be a slide? Yeah. So in my experience, that is big, bold congruent with a message so and uh, i talk about them being a backdrop to your message being a billboard if in effect so it's big and bold and it helps the audience doesn't hinder them and and that and therefore and a handout is obviously a word document or a pages document yeah. Yeah. it is literally something and do that do a handout after you've done your presentation after you've prepared it and everything because then it's very simple and you are allowed to use bullet points on a handout. Yeah, of course you are. Yes, yeah. not so much on a screen. So yeah, yeah, yeah precisely. The handouts and slides are completely separate things. And I, I, yeah, I like that word slide document. I mean, that's exactly right. That's what I say. People just tend to end up with something that doesn't work as a slide or as a handout because they're thinking along both lines and and not thinking that they should do two separate things. And of course, it does mean more work. That's the problem. If people yeah. sometimes are short of time, they've got to do the work to uh, to to. Yeah. to to make the slides and the handouts that's the that's the issue if you can keep the slides simple then it, there's less work to do in the first place yeah and I, I don't think they're um i don't there's not there's no real shortcuts to a good presentation a good presentation in in my experience is analog preparation yep. so using post-it notes and blank sheets and all that yep. kind of stuff uh for the just for listeners know i'm going to do a kind of a back to basics thing on this podcast well, I'll go through a lot of these in the, in the coming weeks. But yeah. so it's so it's analog preparation. Yes. Uh, then gather your stories, work on that. Then go to your slides if you need them. Yep. But you've got to ask yourself the question, do you actually need them? Yep. You know, I've spoken at three funerals in my life. Mm -hmm. None of those required slides. I didn't <laughs> feel they needed slides. I didn't, you know, it was so I, because I'd asked the question, do I need slides? Yes. I didn't just do them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and and then and then thirdly, once you've done all of that, do a handout. That's a PDF or a physical handout. Yeah, would always give that out at the end. Yes, absolutely agree. We're, we're completely on the same page here, Lee. Completely <laughs> on the same page. Yeah, yeah. Start off by. I mean, just going back to my. I've got two acronyms, and and okay. I call it a sample of rice. So you've got the rice bit, but the sample bit is is. I mean, I'll go through it quickly. It's subject, audience, message, place length and execution and these are kind of the questions that i ask before i even start work on a presentation so subject what are you talking about audience who are you talking to message what message are you trying to get across 
place where are you speaking and length how long are you speaking for and then you're right and then we i think go into like you pencil and paper and map out the slides yeah I mean, I, I, it, that can be done in powerpoint if you're used to using powerpoint as a kind of storyboarding mechanism but you but again i know i often will just get a scrap of paper and a pencil and and draw out the slides and then open up the laptop or turn on the pc and um and fire up your powerpoint or your keynote and start making the slides if you need them if they're yeah. going to reinforce, illustrate, clarify, or, or explain the points that you're making. So it's that kind of, it, I, I guess what we're saying on the podcast here is that we, if you want to be a good presenter, you need restraint. You need to actually just not do what everyone else does, and that is open up PowerPoint, yeah. put title, bullet point, title, bullet point, title, bullet point, because yeah. everyone sees those every single day. What we require as professionals is a bit of restraint. To yeah. say, I'll go to my whiteboard first, my flip chart, my notebook. Yeah, stop. Before I do and, anything else. Yeah, you know I mean? stop and look before you start crossing the road. You don't just run across the road. You stop and look first. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think the same yeah, thing yeah. applies when producing a presentation. Stop, think about it, work through what, you, you know, what you're presenting, who you're presenting to, what your message is, mm-hmm. and then decide whether you need to use slides at all or if you do need to use slides whether you know you might just need to use one or two slides it really depends on the points you're trying to get across and whether they need to be reinforced for for the audience yeah i see explain to me how what i like with some of the work you've done dave and we've chatted about this when we've met once or twice is the way that you present data because one of the biggest questions i get all the time is oh that's all very well you saying i need to do this and that lee but I've, I'm very data heavy, so I have to produce data. And yeah. you've got a couple of really innovative ways of showing data. Do you want to explain a couple of the ways that you produce, how you simplify data onto a slide? Yeah, I think the first point is that actually the data tools in PowerPoint, or the chart tools, sorry, should I say, in PowerPoint, are actually really good. But again, people will tend to either, well, two mistakes, they clutter them up with unnecessary information. Mm-hmm. And they'll sometimes use an inappropriate chart that doesn't get the point across that they're trying to make. So they might use the wrong scale or or whatever. So I think if you use the chart tools in PowerPoint sensibly, you can you can get the point across. But yeah, I do. I have done a a few, as you know, a few uh, kind of creative ways of getting data across. There's one that I've got that shows it's actually from my book. Actually, it shows the rising prize money at Wimbledon over the decades. And it shows a tennis player hitting a ball and the ball gets bigger. There's four balls that appear as he hits them towards the screen and they animate towards the screen and they get bigger. And people go, oh, wow, that's brilliant. How do you do that? And again, I'd say it's all done in PowerPoint. It can all be done in PowerPoint. Um, uh, okay. There's a little bit of work involved in cutting out around the ball and cutting out around the tennis player. But again, you can cut out images in PowerPoint. And that's another thing mm-hmm. when you show people that. They go, oh, wow, I didn't know you could do that. And uh, um, <laughs> so it's it's all doable. Obviously, it's quite an advanced technique to do it, mm. but it makes it more memorable, as you know. So if you can produce a data chart that, uh, that okay. sticks in people's minds and that shows the data in a sensible way, then I think that's, yeah. that's a good way to go. But if someone isn't – but you're saying, you're saying some of this stuff requires – you know, it requires a bit of effort. It requires mm. some mm. technical skill. But yeah. actually, there, there was one, one thing that I've seen you work on, which is the beer chart. Yes. Which doesn't – you know, which which really is, it's four pints of beer at kind of various sizes yeah. of, of liquid in the beer. That's the easiest way of, of, yeah. of talking about it, really, isn't it? I've done um, a couple so, of those. Are you, are you talking about the one where the beer actually rises up in the glass? Well, oh. there, there is that, there is that, there's that one. But I, I just think when you see it as a still, yeah. it's, a nice, it's still a nice way of presenting data. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, you, that's right. if you, yeah, I mean, if you've, got a, if you've got an object like a glass of beer that shows the – this this one showed the beer consumption by a country, which, of course, um, Germany came top. Um, of course. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, of course, yeah. I think we were about third or something, but um, – of the five countries involved. But, yeah, so if you take an object and just scale it up on the slide from small to large yeah. to represent the increase across countries or time or whatever it happens to be – that can work really well, yeah. So that so that isn't particularly an advanced technique because you just take the image and yeah. scale it up in PowerPoint. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'll I'll give you a link to uh, to Dave's website at the end. This is actually on your front page. This one, the beer slide revisited. I think you call it. That's it. Yeah, that's the so, one with it. That's that is a much more complicated one. That particular one. That's yeah. the one where the the beer rises up in the glass. But there are yeah, there is one where animation. I, I do use stills as well. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I guess so. So if if someone has no no real technical skills mm. and they have no budget to sort of outsource that, then the simplest way, obviously, is to simplify your slides. Go for big, clean images. Yeah. Keep them real simple. And what, yeah. but if they've got a little bit of budget, they can do some of the animation. So how? So so if you've got this beer slide, which I can, I'm looking at in front of me. There's five countries on it. Yeah. And various size. Italy's fifth, UK's yeah. fourth, USA, Spain, and Germany. We're fourth up. That's right. Yes, that's, that's it. We're fourth. Yeah. Yeah. So we're fourth yeah. in the world. Yeah. But, but that's that. There's an animated version of that where the 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 beer rises up in the glass. Yeah. So how long does how long does it take you to sort of program that within PowerPoint? That particular style was probably one of the most complicated ones I've done because it it required quite a lot of graphical work, which is. Yeah. Just to just to digress for a second, that's an interesting point because people and you you probably had it as well. People say, "Oh, what's the best program for producing slides? Is it PowerPoint or Keynote? What should I what should I learn?" Uh, and my answer to that is that well, they're they're both tools. They, they both do the same kind of job. But if you really want to learn how to produce good slides, learn how to produce good images. Learn an image management program like Photoshop or something like that because that really can up up your you know make a step change to to what you present. And so that beer slide, it is it is a complicated one that because I had to produce the the beer glasses, and then the beer in between that that kind of morphed from from the bottom of the or from behind the bottom of the glass into yeah. the glass itself, and then I had to produce a, a semi transparent front panel for the glass oh, for, the refle- for the reflection. So so that's probably not the best one to uh, to yeah yeah. Uh, it probably took me I don't know. If, four or five hours to do that one but, but oh, okay so that that did involve quite some advanced techniques yeah. but, the, but, but but i go but what we're saying is you don't need advanced techniques right you don't need no you don't i mean you can do as, as i said if you if you can learn the, the animation techniques in powerpoint and again make sure that you use animations purposefully make sure that the animations also adhere to the rice principle that if they if the animations can reinforce illustrate clarify or explain a point then then great use them but if you can use animations creatively and you can just do simple image manipulation, then I think um, that will give you a, a, a couple of really good tools to add to your presentation toolbox. Yeah, that's great. That's excellent. So, so, so much good stuff here, and people will struggle. So, uh, just to, to know where to start, really. I mean, the, the, I, I've talked a little bit about. Uh, I've got a course on Udemy. I got my PowerPoint surgery course. That yeah, ticks away there. In the background, it's got several hours of stuff. And um, but w- what I noticed was when I went on Udemy, which is an on if you didn't people don't know, it's an online platform yeah. for um, various courses. W- w- what I really noticed was everything else on slides and PowerPoint on Udemy was about making them how making them really really complicated. Right. Okay. So they they were all about how to make <laughs> things spin around, how to make yeah. things disappear. Yeah. And and so people spend a lot of money and a lot of time learning the whizzy techniques. Yeah. Not really understanding the fundamentals, which is mm. the rice in your case, you know, the, the rice fundamental, yeah. you know, of do you actually need a slide? Will it reinforce what you're doing right now? Mm. And I find that it's funny how we as human beings want to make things more complicated than they need to be, really. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm with you. Keeping it simple is is is. One of a, you know is, is is a mantra as well. Just you know, you're you're the one that's you're you're the presenter on stage, and your slides are just there to support the message you're trying to get across to the audience. So they don't have to be complicated. I mean, th- there is a, there is a time and place for more complex slides. I mean, I've produced slides in the past where I've produced charts for uh, data charts for um, pharmaceutical companies where you, they're doing these trials, and those are quite complicated charts. But the most important point there is that the audience are also pharmaceutical people and they understand those charts and, that, and they want to okay. see that data it's quite important to them to see that data so they need that kind of level of complexity but most audiences don't most audiences want things to be explained in a simple way and and for the point to actually you know lodge in their brains when, when they go away yeah yeah so it's about yeah so uh, but but even even when i've worked with clients that want me to work on their presentations when they even if they're kind of, oh, we, we, the audience will understand my complicated stuff. Yeah. Even then, I think it's about simplification because no one ever wants you to produce comp because a complicated thing needs to be more of a an email, a spreadsheet, a handout than mm. a really complicated slide. So yeah. 
one of the things I, I, I quite enjoy doing is, is encouraging people to put your complicated graph up, but yeah. then immediately click to the next slide, which mm. zooms in on that graph yeah. and shows you the three indices that you really want to talk about. Yes. So there's I was no about to say the same thing. I was going to say that um, one of the techniques I, I teach is to is how to mask stuff out. So if you really need to show a complex right. slide for some reason or another, but there are important points on it that you want to highlight, then you can quite easily in PowerPoint do a mask that kind of fades everything back and just focuses in on the point that you're trying to make. Or as you say, you zoom it up. You, 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 can, you can zoom it up so you're looking at those points. So there are ways of, of showing something that's complex but then focusing in on the on the part that's important. But if but, yeah. but again, if the part that's important is the only bit you want to show, then then ditch the rest anyway. And just show the part that's important. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's it's amazing how we overcomplicate things, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, I think even for our listeners now, if you if you have a moment, if you're if you're in the car, don't close your eyes. Uh, but if you <laughs> if you have a moment now, just have a little think back to the presentations that you remember over your life so it could be when you were a kid it could be a wedding it could be a funeral it could be a business presentation a school presentation if you have a little think now what you will remember is most likely story and impact i bet no one has said i remember those amazing slides yeah <laughs> Yeah. Right. Because even though we make some good slides that people, that's not what we remember. What we remember is someone making an impact and that makes an impact by simplifying the message. Yeah. So co complicated speakers are never, ever remembered in a positive light, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I would say there, there, there is occasionally a time and place for it but not that often i, I would i would agree yeah. yeah but but i'm also part of me i also, also like the idea of putting on a show as well making sure that the slides i would say that the slides are as important as the presenter purely because as we just said earlier that people yeah. are going to focus on the slides as much as they are on the presenter when the slides are on the screen so if the slides aren't as professional as a the speaker then you're letting yourself down i think yeah, yeah. People can spend days and days planning presentations and then just cobble together some slides. Right? Mm, yeah. <laughs> it's always they, like they, they do. Well, you not yeah. you and I both know that even professional speakers use bad slides sometimes, don't they? Yeah, I've uh, yeah, there's been moments when yeah. I've seen other professionals and I've winced when I've seen their slides. Yeah. Or they've used a video that's like such low resolution or something. And you're just thinking, wow, that's like a, that is really bad. You know, um, there is, yeah, bad videos, bad slides can can really take away yeah. from exactly what you're doing. But people have this thing like, oh, I'm big enough to carry a bad slide. I'm a good enough storyteller to carry yeah. a bad slide. I'm a good enough speaker yeah. to engage an audience. Well, it's like, it's like saying, well, yeah, you're a good runner, but you've like chopped your left leg off to make yourself, <laughs> you know, you're probably yeah. better with your left leg. Yeah. And so you're better off having good slides and good story yeah. and good preparation and delivery, you know. Why let yourself down with bad slides? I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just think that, I mean, and, and the main issue, I would, as, as, I, as I'm sure you understand as well, is that people don't know how to do it. Yeah. So they so they do it badly, and it's a and it's like anything in life. If you don't know how to do something, you've got you've got a few choices. You can either not do it at all, or you can do it badly, or you can learn to do it, <laughs> or you can get someone else to do it for you. There's there's four choices yeah, yeah. basically. Yeah, you yeah, can you know. easily pay people to make them. And actually, sometimes using a coach or someone with your slides, you know, like we've done over the years, you you it actually helps to have another set of eyes on on your presentation. Anyway, I think generally, doesn't it? You know. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah, I think it does. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I I like to think that I'm I'm and I'm sure you do like to think that we're both good at producing slides. But uh, you know, you sometimes get people saying, well, "I don't quite like the way you've done that or the way you've done that," and you think, oh, "Okay, that's quite a good point. I haven't thought about that before." You know, so yeah, you know, no, nothing's perfect, but uh, if you mm. can aim for you, if you can aim for, for perfection, then you you know you're going to get somewhere near. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so one of the questions that people ask me a lot about is images. Yes. So where do I get my images from? And you've got a helpful blog about about Google not being a stock image site. Yes. And uh, just, so, so how do you, where do you send people to 
if they want to use images on a slide, well, what's your advice about that, Dave? Yeah, I get that all the time. People will send me a bunch of images and you know that um, they've got them from Google Images because a lot of people think that Google Images is a stock library. You know, do a search on Google. I can just use this image here and there. And if you're yeah. professional, then you shouldn't do that because it's actually, you know, as you know, it's copyright and it's it's stealing. It's, it's a bit like going into Sainsbury's and half inch and a packet of digestive biscuits. You know, you can get away with it, but you probably <laughs> shouldn't do it. So there are, yeah, there's loads of sources of uh, of free or cheap images. The two sites that I use for free images are Pixabay, P-I-X-A-B-A-Y, and Unsplash, U-N-S-P-L-A-S-H. Okay. And they've got millions of images on there. But I also use Shutterstock. Shutterstock, when I looked at it this week, I think yeah. they've got 270 million images on there. So if you can't oh. find an image on Shutterstock that you uh, that you want, then you're unlikely yeah. to find it anywhere. Uh, and it's, and it's, that's a paid cheap, one, isn't, isn't it, that it? one? Sorry? That one's a paid one, isn't it? It is, but it's not that expensive. I mean, obviously, in my case, it's not too bad because if I'm using images from Shutterstock, I will be charging the client. So it's But but yeah. but the, 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 the package I use from Shutterstock it costs me about six pound an image so it's not expensive not compared yeah. to again going back to the olden days when you used to have to go through cardboard boxes of dusty old five by four transparencies trying to find the one that you wanted and then you'd pay 150 quid or something for the, for, for the use of the image um yes. you know these days it's a it's a luxury you can get images very cheaply or yeah. you can use creative commons which is basically images that are copyright free which either means people have donated them, which, for example, the ones on Pixabay and Unsplash fall under that, but also images that are out of copyright, like old paintings, for example, because I think the the rule is that once the author's been dead 70 years, the copyright goes back into the public domain. So you pictures of old pictures of you know Henry VIII or something you yeah. can use because they're um, they're out of copyright. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, yeah, it's a little bit like music. Music goes out of copyright a little while. That's yeah. why Cliff Richard was uh, trying to change the rules, wasn't he? Because okay. no one, no one expected him to be around for so long. <laughs> no. Yes, yeah. So, so that's unsplash. dot yep. com uh, for loads of images there. And there is, uh, I was just trying to count up. I just having a quick look at Unsplash. It doesn't give you the numbers, but it's big numbers there. And yep. Pixabay has over a million high stock, high quality images. And I think they're all free, aren't they? Uh, they are all free. You might find just one, a, f- a few every now and then will say that they're for editorial use only, where there are people in the image that have been, that can be identified. So just be a little bit careful of that. But otherwise, they're all free. Yeah. And then, of course, the, the best source of free images are the ones we take ourselves. Yeah. yeah. That's it. That's so, why I say at the end. If you, <laughs> if you really can't find an image, then think about taking it yourself. Because yeah. that's, you know, copyright is automatically yours then. Yeah, uh, yeah, and that's that's good. I I, I use one in, my, in one of my talks, and it's um, of the time in Sainsbury's when it had been snowing for three days, and everyone took all the bread out of Sainsbury's. Oh, okay. So I, I just happened to be in Sainsbury's. I took a photograph of empty shelves. Yeah. Because I'd never seen empty shelves in Sainsbury's yeah, yeah. before. Just little things like that. You just take your phone out. You see something quirky, interesting. Yeah. Even even pe- people's, you know, if you if you work in a co- if you work in a company and you're listening to this. If you're at a company, people want to see people's faces. So show your team's faces. Show a shot of the warehouse people. You know, show real faces on your slides. It makes a big difference, you know. Yeah, people yeah. Say, so this is the team we're working with. These are the warehouse team that you'll be working with. This is John. She works in this section. This is Peter. He works in this section. And just people's faces and and. Things rather than using weird kind of matchstick men and stuff oh, like that. Oh, oh, don't don't get me started on matchstick men. Oh, matchstick men! Three, and, ubiquitous three D stick men. I don't like them at all. No. Yeah, because there's there was the old one, the, the Microsoft ones, with the, literally were matchstick men. Yeah, and, and then there's those weird kind of faceless, chubby matchstick yeah, men. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I I they just them. they just oh, I hate them as well with a passion. Them th- them and Comic Sans typeface are my two um my. T- <laughs> Too big uh, um, so but let's also talk about what... Comic Sans. So oh. Comic Sans uh, <laughs> yeah. is such a bad font that it actually has its own website called bancomicsans.com. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's how bad it is. Yeah. Uh, Comic Sans uh, was a, if if you don't know, was a font that was designed for comics. So if you're designing a Spider-Man comic, then you use something like Comic Sans because that's the comic font. The clue is in the title. But people started using it for business presentations. And it is the cheesiest font, and it makes everything look childish, doesn't it? And uh, cheap, you know. I think the f- f- the font you use influences the tone of your presentation, 
and your credibility will just go down to zero if ever you use Comic Sans. Unless you're <laughs> presenting to a room full of five-year-olds, then you might get away with it, but um, yeah. never use Comic Sans in business. There's a pub down not far from where I live, and it's called The Royal, uh, but its sign is in Comic Sans. It's the most incongruous thing you've ever seen. A pub, it's a pub called The Royal. Oh, no. The sign is in Comic Sans, and, I, and it just means that you know I've never been in there, and I never will, not while the sign is in Comic Sans. If they change it to... <laughs> So let, let's just clarify, Dave. You wouldn't drink in that pub. No, I wouldn't. The sign drink. is in Comic Sans. It's not that. It's not. It's it's, it's a few miles down the, down, down the road <laughs> from me. But um, yeah, no, I wouldn't. Uh, I, mean, I think the fact that the sign's in Comic Sans gives me an indication that it's probably not the sort of pub I want to go into. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, yeah. yeah. So if, if there's a little clue in the title, if I had a pub called the Royal, yeah, I would have an ornate royal gold font, wouldn't You'd you? Have that, That's wouldn't a... you? Yeah. Yeah, rather than Comic Sans, and it just it just looks wrong. It just looks wrong. So, it does. <laughs> so a couple of things about fonts. Give our listeners maybe two or three fonts that they could use, you know, that they would be good for business and for professional speaking and public speaking. Yeah, well, it, I think it all depends on, on, on the speaker. But uh, Google Fonts is a brilliant source of fonts because they're free and you can download them. I use Google Fonts all the time now. One important technical point, actually, with PowerPoint is make sure that you always embed your fonts. It's quite a convoluted process to do that in PowerPoint. You have to, If you Google it, you'll find how to do it. But embedding your fonts means that if you, if you send it to someone else, then the fonts will work. If they, if they whether they've got them on their machine or not. If you don't embed the fonts, then it will default to another font and that will just throw your presentation out altogether. But fonts, um, yeah, I've... Oh, there are, yeah, no, I mean, I would say if you look at Google fonts uh, and th- th- there's thousands of fonts on there, don't mix fonts up too much on the presentation. Maximum okay. of two, maximum of two, I'd say. But you can even use one if you're using different types of... Uh, different, yeah. you know, different weights, different colours of font. But, but yeah, I think the, the, the font is can can have a big influence on the tone of the presentation and i know so i was okay. talking to someone recently and she said that she was kind of font blind she didn't get it she couldn't really tell the difference between fonts so it's maybe because i've been around the industry for so long now that a, a, a font can have that kind of almost visceral effect <laughs> but, uh, yeah you notice it yeah well when yeah, i take so. when, when i have people on my presentation skills course i i say to them if you ever do film studies at college it ruins you watching a film for the rest of your life because you can dissect it. Yeah. And, and you're going to be with me for the day, so I'm going to ruin every presentation you'll ever go to <laughs> because I'm going to I'm going to show you how they work and why that was there. And yeah. same with slides and that you can just see the fonts. But so, yeah, yeah so I mean, I mean, a couple of nice, there's a couple of nice basic ones. I mean, uh, Helvetica is your standard kind of Mac font, Helvetica New. There, that's a fairly decent standard font. Yeah, I mean, I, Arial was the same on on, on PC. Um, it, it's got it's got and and a lot, a lot of corporates will use these fonts because they know they're going to be portable from device to device. One font I would that the my, one, one issue I have is with Calibri. It's a font that is the default Office font on PC. And it's a nice font. It was designed by Microsoft to to, to work well on uh, on screens, but because it's the default. Font, I'm completely ubiquitous now. Everyone just opens up PowerPoint and starts typing away with Calibri rather than even thinking about changing the font. Yeah. So, you know, if you want your font, if you want your presentation to look different, try and steer away from Calibri. Yeah. But, I, I think uh, Calibri, I, I don't like it. It's quite, um, it's, it, yeah, it just looks a bit cheap. I think now, I think it's, I think it's aged a little bit now. Yeah. One. Yeah. It's, it's really... overused. I think it's because it gets overused that, that people, that people get so fed up with seeing it. Yeah. Yeah. I think someone said, if you're, if your if your presentation is in size twelve times New Roman, it doesn't it doesn't say anything about your design technique. It just shows that you're a lazy person. Yeah. <laughs> because, yeah. because if it's the same with Calibri, anything is times New Roman or Calibri. Yeah, because time yeah. used to be the default, didn't it? Originally, when when That's they when, when these programs first started up in the late eighties and uh, Times New Roman was the standard type. I think you had one you had one serif typeface which was Times New Roman and one sans serif typeface which was Arial or Helvetica, and that was it. Yeah. yeah. So just explain to people what, what a serif is, sans serif and serif font. Just explain serif fonts, know that. Yeah, serif fonts are, if you look at um, well, if you look at the Times newspaper, which uses Times typeface, the little curly bits on the edge of the letters, they've probably got a, they've probably got a proper name. I don't know what their proper name is. But uh, if you look at the T, it has a little bit hanging down from the top to the top bar and yeah. a little bit off, off the foot of the T. And those are called serifs. And it's supposed to make reading small text, upper and lowercase small text, a lot easier. Um, and I think it does. You'll see that most books, most novels are written in a serif typeface, and doesn't. I think it does make things easier to read. 
I think you struggle. I think people who struggle with with reading find it better with a sans serif. So sans means without. So sans yeah. serif font is without the fancy bit, really. Yeah, um, say, yeah. You know, which is a, a, a standard font. But but the people often say to me, even going back to fonts, say, oh, uh, Comic Sans is good for people with dyslexia. Oh, yeah, apparently, yes, I've heard that one before as well. But it's just not true because, first of all, it's a comic sand. It's it's a it's a comic font. Yeah. And secondly, there is a dyslexia font that is issued worldwide for free yeah. by the dyslexia associations across the world, mm. and it's called dyslexic font. So it's, okay. it's, it's it is literally there, right? And it's available if you need to do that. Yeah. Um, so the dyslexic font, dyslexia, is even there. So it's even not an excuse to use. You know, to, to use kind of uh, yeah, and I think the biggest, favor, the, things, the biggest you know? favor you can do to dyslexic people is to cut right down on the amount of text you're using anyway, which is what which is one of the big principles, and to use bigger text. So rather than worrying about the font you're going to use for your 300 words on your slide, you know, cut it down to three or four words, use bigger text, and um, and, and Bob's your uncle. Yeah. So there is a there's there's two there's a, a font called Dyslexy that's with an I E at the end Dyslexy yeah. and there's an Open Dyslexic which is another font for people and so when you when you Google if you actually Google what's the best font for dyslexia it comes yeah. up with the two dyslexia fonts yes which is perfect and you can use those if you need to use those in your environment but generally a good quality font if it's clear and there's a little bit you know you're not filling pushing the screen, filling it every minute, it'll yeah. be absolutely fine. Because yeah. people with disabilities yeah. will be able to work on that. On the, they'll, they'll, you know, there's lots of people I've worked with with disabilities, uh, learning disabilities, and you know, cognitive stuff like dyslexia. It's mm -hmm. it's really quite common now, and I think it is becoming a little bit easier to deal with. So don't use that as an excuse to use Comic Sans. I think is what yes. I'm saying. Don't use anything as an excuse to use Comic Sans. <laughs> 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 so that's great. So great. That's brilliant, Dave. So we've covered loads of stuff there. Basic slide stuff. We've covered the rice thing, which is reinforce, illustrate, clarify, explain. Rice is the acronym. That's I, when you're going thinking of using a slide. Is it part of the rice thing? Mm -hmm. Does it reinforce? Does it illustrate? Does it clarify? Does it explain? We've talked about going to blank slides or inserting black slides just to just to prevent the sl the slides always being there. Yep. Uh, we've talked about getting your slides congruent to your message, so they're not clashing with what you're saying, but adding to what you say, being a backdrop to what you say. Yeah. And we've generally exactly. talked about fonts, and we've also just talked about decluttering, haven't we, Dave? So, yes. So, uh, great, Dave. We've talked about loads of great stuff. So, um, just give us one last tip, and then tell us where you can be found on the interweb if people want to the interweb did i say that it's interweb <laughs> interweb into, you know the world wide web so people can actually find you because you've got loads of free videos and resources haven't you out there so yeah absolutely. give us one last tip and tell us where you live online dave okay um i suppose one last tip would be to um to because well, one of the problems you get with slides is people find that it kind of structures their talk a little bit they're they're kind of hamstrung by the use of slides and i've seen it before with a, a really experienced speaker who did some slides for who was talking away in his usual confidence style and he went to the next slide and then realized when the slide came up that he'd missed the whole chunk of his speech out and it flummoxed him so i think it's really important as with any as with any talk to rehearse and rehearse with the slides so you're really comfortable with the slides that you've got on the screen you know what's coming next obviously you can use presenter view in powerpoint so you can see if you've got the laptop in front of you what slides are coming next but just make sure that you get really well rehearsed. And it obviously means you've got to do you know, a bit more work than you would do if you were just doing a, a speech. And, and, and I've also spoken about where you shouldn't use your slides as a prompt. You should never do that. However, if, the, if it's a byproduct of using slides, they accidentally act as a prompt, then great. That's, that's good. They can, they can help you through the, uh, through the talk. But make sure you're rehearsed. Make sure you're comfortable with using slides. And I think that's, a, that's, a, you know, that's quite an important point. Um, and as for where I can be found, well, the website is theslidepresentationman.co.uk. I have a small but growing Facebook group called Presentation Perfection. So if anyone would like to join that, just go onto Facebook and request to join. Um, and on LinkedIn, you can search for me. You can actually you, you can actually search for the Slide Presentation Man on LinkedIn, and um, and I think I come up as the number one result for that as well. So, so that's my that's where I reside on the uh, on the web and the, on the internet. Great, fantastic stuff. I definitely advise uh, looking into Dave's stuff. 
and uh, yeah, book him for your stuff. And uh, we've I've even referred stuff to business to you before. You Dave, have, you have, yes. Thank you, and thank you very much for that. It's all right. I'm sorry. I'm not saying that for plaudits. I'm just saying that, you know, I believe in what you're doing and I think you do a good job and your background and your history in this kind of industry just helps to bring a shine a light on, you know, what can be a pretty dark subject of death by PowerPoint, you know, and I think it's yeah. nice to do that. And um, Absolutely, yeah. that's great. Oh, yeah. I'll also mention my online course. My book was called PowerPoint Surgery. So the mm. online course is at powerpointsurgery.com, powerpointsurgery.com. And as uh, I think it's about four hours of content and stuff there that you can see. But that was great. Dave, you're a legend. I appreciate your honesty and your time. Thank and, you, Lee. My pleasure. And Scott, and I, I'm sure we'll come back for part two where we'll get a bit more hands-on, a bit more practical. We should do some videos together, Dave, maybe. We That'll should be good. do. We should do, shouldn't we? Yeah, yeah. That'll, be nice. That'll be good. Yeah, brilliant. So, he'll be back. So that was Dave Henson, the slide presentation man.co.uk. And uh, I am Lee Jackson. And this was get good at presenting i'll see you next time cheers thanks for listening to the get good at presenting podcast with your host lee jackson if you'd like to know more about lee's work as a motivational keynote speaker and presentation coach visit his website at leejackson.biz that's leejackson.biz